there you go. You're all set now. Go ahead and hit record and we should be in good shape. Okay, you, yes, you we're recording now. So welcome everybody to our third dressage talk. Uh, we will not continue using those numbers because we hope to have many from now on. But I will start by saying that I'm very happy to have our two guests today. To, they're gonna be Lauren Samis and Lee Topman. Both of them really wonderful friends of mine and really wonderful equestrians and professional equestrians. I will start uh, presenting Lauren. Lauren has been a Pan American Games gold medalist, a two-time US team medalist, and she won team gold and individual silver at the Rio de Janeiro Pan Am Games in 2007. She's been very famous with her horse Sagacious, which we talked the other day in our previous dressage talk. She's also a USDF gold, silver, and bronze medalist. And Lauren runs a training and a teaching business in New Jersey in the summers, and she usually travels to Wellington for the winter season. So Lauren, thank you very much for accepting this invitation and for joining us, okay? Thank you for thank you for having me. This is a great opportunity for everybody while we're home. And uh, thanks thanks for having me. Okay, now I will introduce Lee Topman. Lee has many years of experience as a judge. He's now based in Wellington, Florida, and he travels across Canada, the U.S., uh, South America, and he does dressage clinics and judging. Lee is an FEI four-star judge from Canada. He's also an uh, S-judge from Canada and S-judge for USEF. He was a very successful competitor. And one thing that is very interesting uh, about Lee is that he's been on all the sides. Like I remember once we were judging the North American and Junior Dressage Championships, and he was a rider there, then he was a trainer there, and he's now been judging that show for several years. So he has all the experience. Lee, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Cesar. Okay, so I think we'll start with the, the conversation. And uh, the topic today is how professional equestrians handle the ups and downs. So, I will start uh, with some general questions, and uh, of course, I, I will start with, uh, with uh, Lauren first. Lauren, could you tell us when do, did you decide to become a professional, and how did that happen? Um, so for me, I had been riding all of my life. Um, but I had been riding as in my grandmother owned a farm and I was riding the Shetland ponies that she got and I was riding bareback and I was, I was just riding. I having a good time as a kid and I got involved with 4-H. I wasn't, I never did the young riders. I never did the juniors. We, I, um, we didn't have the money to do that when I was growing up. So I did 4-H when I was growing up then. And um, I always knew that I wanted to ride. And I said to my father that I wanted to ride when I was um, mm. coming out of high school. And he, of course, said, well, you're, you can't make a job out of that, so you need to go to college. So that's what I did. And I went to, to college and I got a business degree, which at the time I thought was a total waste of my time. But now as a parent, I see what a great time that was in my life and how much I needed those years to grow up. And then when I came out of college, I, I jumped in with two feet and I, I um, started being a working student for people, which I did for many, many, many years. And then I, I, uh, I always had the attitude that if I worked hard enough, I would make anything work. So I, I, I said, that this is what I wanted to do, and I and I jumped in after college, and I I uh, I dove for it. So that's that was I never did anything else. 
Okay, and let me ask you one thing. Did you have any internal conflicts when you were making the decision of becoming a professional? Was it easy? Was it tough? How was it? Um, you know, I, I think I, I, again, I jumped into it and I really, I wanted to prove that I could do it. So in my early 20s, I, I hit the, the ground running and I just put my head down and I, I never thought about doing anything else. So the, the thought of being professional, I don't think that crossed my mind. I knew that I, I wanted to ride, I, I wanted to ride horses, and I, wanted, and I needed to make a living. So um, there wasn't a thought of, you know, is, is this what I, I'm gonna turn professional or anything like that. I knew that this is what I wanted to do with my life. And I, I probably bit off way more than I had the experience to when I was younger. And, uh, but, you know, I just, I, I went for it. And as far as my, my father, my father, again, his, his point of view was people don't really make a living riding horses. What are you doing? And his, his suggestion to me when I said that I wanted to ride horses is he said that I should probably become a mounted policeman. So that was his idea of me becoming a rider. And I, I said that I probably didn't want to do that. And, um, but then I started, and again, I was a working student and I, and I worked for people and I tried to be around people that I saw doing what I wanted to do. And my father became my biggest fan of my business and he saw all the work that I put into it and, and uh, came back years later and said, I, I don't know how you did it, but, but you made it work. So I uh, glad I did. Okay, that's great. And Lee, how and, how and when did you decide to become a professional? And uh, well, I didn't actually decide as well. Um, I come from a very small province in Canada very rural community, uh, the middle of the middle of nowhere, so to speak. And my parents were farmers. And they supported me in, in my early years of riding. But eventually, it came to a point where I needed to leave and I needed to grow. I needed more uh, information, more training. And if that wasn't possible, then I was going to quit and do something else. So uh, at my first Young Riders, I'd met Crystal at Boylet. And uh, I contacted her. Uh, and we arranged that I would go to Cedar Valley, Ontario. My parents agreed to this for one year. They said they would pay for one year. And my dad and I loaded up my horse and drove five days to get to Ontario. And it was October. And when we arrived and got to the stable and I was settled, um, a big snowstorm came. He flew home and I was stuck there until at least May, whether I liked it or not. So I stayed and I did my year apprenticeship at uh, the Prox Barn. Um, but into it, about nine or 10 months, I realized that this was coming to a conclusion. And I also realized that although I, I did not dislike where I came from, I love it, but I had more ambition in life than to just go back there. And uh, I'd also been to the big city and I was uh, exposed to all kinds of things in life that I'd never seen in the country. And I didn't want to go back. I wanted to expand my horizons. So I had to find a way to stay. And one of the girls that was also in training at the barn taught at a riding school in the city. And she said, I think that you'd be good at teaching. So I went down and I met the boss and he gave me an application. I looked at the application, I read it over. And uh, there were several requirements, one of which, which uh, you had to have experience. So I thought of it and I thought that I went to a 4-H camp and I helped kids tack up horses and get on. So I thought that was experience in teaching, I taught them how to get on. And uh, you had to be 21, so I became 21. And um, I started to teach. And honestly, I had no idea what I was doing. I just said things that everybody else said to me, but I did it with conviction and I did it with a deep voice. And all the people I was teaching for the most part were really super green, so they didn't know. But it took me about a year to figure out really what to say and the timing of saying it. Um, but I did that so that I could stay in Ontario. And then that forced me to do all the other stuff that we do, teaching, clinics, all of that. So that's how all that got started. Okay, and Lawrence, could, could you mention any particular mentor or any special 
person that became like your role model where you were growing uh, into a professional, into the professional that you are today? Well, I, again, I was a working student for 10 or 15 years where I did not make any money. And I worked for London Gray. I worked for Temple Farms, where I worked for George Williams and Carl McCulka. I worked for Tina Konya. Um, I got to ride with Michelle Gibson. I rode with Sue Blinks a little bit. I, um, I got to ride with a lot of different people. And honestly, it was, it was not, I was never a paying client. I was a working student. I was, I was just trying to make my way. But the person that I always use as my go-to person and I think of who who do I want to be in my life and who do I want to model is always Ashley Holzer. There's no question. As a professional, as a writer, as a mother, as a complete person in the equestrian world, I think Ashley is the one that I look up to the most. Okay, and Lee, you, you already mentioned Crystal at Boiling, but do you have in your head some other special person that promoted you as a trainer, as a judge? Yeah, for sure. Um, when I was at that stable, uh, it was owned by the Proc family, Hans and Avi Proc, and uh, they were great people, and Hans and I had a great rapport, uh, and he was a, a good mentor with a lot of things, not just with riding, about other things. Um, their trainer at that time was Walter Zettel, and I kind of grew up with him in the early years in Ontario. And my dad lived 3,000 miles away, so uh, he was kind of a second father to me. And we had great conversations about everything, training, um, in life, all of that stuff. So he was great. Um, Judging-wise, I'd say uh, when I met Dieter Schula in Germany, he and I hit it off really well, and we had a great rapport. Um, and he kind of took me under his wing and, you know, guided me and, and uh, tried to keep me in the direction that he thought was best for me. So he was a mentor. Um, and I'll say one other person as a coach, completely non-horse related. In Ontario, there I think was one winter season that we had uh, um, a coaching session. Um, and a, a professor from Western University and I would go to different barns and we did this coaching thing for coaches. And I would talk to them about technically what they said about dressage, and he would speak to them about their coaching. And uh, he was really a role model for me in coaching. Uh, and I got a tremendous amount of information from him um, from the point of view of, of teaching other people, which then I would have applied to the horses as well. And uh, the last, I wouldn't say lastly, but another one would be my dad. Uh, my dad's still alive. He'll be 97 in a week. Um, and he was a great mentor growing up. Fantastic person with animals. We had animals all our lives. And uh, he, was, he was always uh, very good with me. And one of the most important things that he ever, ever said to me or asked me was a question. And what would you do if I wasn't here? And almost every day I think about that. If there's some task that I have to take on, something that, that how would I end up handling that? So uh, that I really appreciate and, and he was also a great mentor to me. Okay, Lauren, so I would like to ask you a question from the public now. What, what would you consider the most difficult thing for a professional? Like money or finding the right horse, finding the right sponsor, finding the right trainer, a combination of those things. What, what has been the, the most difficult thing for your equestrian career? Well, um, number one, I have to say that I've never had a sponsor. So I can't say that I've ever had a sponsor. I've, to me, there's a, a sponsor situation as somebody that pays for a rider but they also are paying that rider a salary. So when that, that person is say going to big shows or going to Europe or going to train or things like that, and they're leaving their other business, that, that they are a salaried person. To me, that's the difference between a sponsored rider. I've been paid 
for training of her horses per month, for example, for, for sagacious. Al was very generous with me on many, 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 many things, but he, um, he was uh, paying, he paid me per month to ride the horse. It was a very clean relationship like that. I think, um, first of all, to find the right horse, to find the owner who is on board, enthusiastic, um, there's so many ups and downs, even in the best situation with, uh, you know, with a sound horse that you can have soundness issues with, with so many different situations. It is um, so many variables. So I would say that I can't exactly say that there's one hardest point. I can say that to be at the top level, you have to have everything has to align at the same time. You have to have the best horse. You have to have a great owner. You have to have the ability to put the time into that very, very special horse because one special horse takes a lot of time and a lot of teamwork with everybody included. So it's, it's um, meshing all of those things together. That's, that's great, Lauren. And I, we were talking before we started this uh, dressage talk. And Lauren was telling me that for her it's very important to establish a good relationship with a breeder to hopefully grade a wonderful horse or to have other horses to train and sell along the way. So I, I would like to ask you, how is it easy to establish relation with breeders in the US or abroad or not? I've not had, honestly, any success in it. And I, you know, I've come off of some highlights in my career that I've done quite well. Um, and I've always thought to myself when I, when I no longer had the ride on Sagacious, I did reach out to many, many breeders across the country saying that I was looking for something to ride. I was looking to establish that relationship that not only if they had a great horse, but they had some other horses that I could be riding and training along the way and, and selling and, 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 and helping with the finances towards a great horse. But I, I found it very difficult to get into, to form that relationship. Um, so that's something that I, I mean, I think that it, I think that that's it, it, either you have a sponsor or you have somebody who has the access to many horses because it does take a, you know, a, a long time to find that special horse. So I, you know, that relationship is something that I do look for. Okay, thank you. And Leah, along the same lines, what, what would you consider the most difficult thing for a professional as a trainer and as a judge? Well, I think that you have to understand that you have to be more than just the trainer of a horse. This was one of the first things that, that really um, hit me in the face starting out, and that was uh, I just thought, well, you know, if I ride well, that that will be enough. But it's not because uh, you need to be uh, an accountant, you need to be a financial planner. I never had a family, but you need to be a family planner. Um, you need to think about what you're doing in the future. You're a sports psychologist, you're a psychologist, you're a psychiatrist, you're a best friend. You wear so many different hats doing all of this with the people that you end up working with. And you can say, well, you know, I, I will stay detached and I, I will just be professional and uh, but there eventually you end up working with some people that are really uh, comfortable to be around or easygoing and you become friends. So this isn't just a one dimensional thing. Um, my first year as an FEI judge coming back here to Wellington was not easy. I mean, that was something I looked forward to for a very long time. But I mean, you have to look at where I came from. I came from out of the show ring. I, I think I just shown a year or, or two years prior to that. And I'd show in every year for almost 35 years. So I knew all of these people. And then my first year, nobody knew what to say. Do they say hello? Do they not say hello? Do they shake my hand? Do they give me a hug and a kiss? Like whatever. I mean, it was brutally awkward. Um, it was also very difficult trial by fire. My first CDI being in Wellington. I mean, it would have been nice if it was someplace else. It's just one show, but no, it was here. And I think I did three that season, and I think it was Pan Ams. And uh, Lloyd put me at sea for a Friday night freestyle at the same time. 
So that was a lot of pressure. I remember asking him, you know, because we were kind of friends and, and I said, do you have anything that you can tell me? You know, and I was looking for mentorship. And he said, yeah, go to CVS and buy some Depends. And then slapped me on the back and sent me on my way. So there's a, I think that this is multifaceted. And when you start out, you don't know that. You're naive and you just want to ride and do a good job. So that was a strong learning curve. <clears throat> okay. If, 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 if you two allow me, I'm going to tell the audience a story, which, because I think we can all learn a little bit from that. Once, some years ago, I was, a print, I was doing a shadow judging with a wonderful judge from Holland that has already died, Beam Ernst, a wonderful judge and a wonderful person. And I was working in my four stars. So I was doing shadow judging with him. And we were at E and Lee was judging at B. Okay. And... It happened that Lauren Samis came down the center line. And she finished her test. At the end of the test, there was a big difference among the judges, Lee being the highest one. Uh, I think uh, Veeam, who I was sitting with, was kind of in the middle. 66. And and uh, well, so Lauren had to deal with that. Lee had to deal with that too. And all the judges had to get together and discuss the whole thing. And because I was a shadow judging, I was doing my shadow judging. I mean, this was a very important thing to discuss for everybody. So I would like to ask you too, what, what do you think of that situation? What did you learn from that situation? I can explain afterwards what I learned from that because we all learn from those things. So what do you think of, how, how, how was your feeling when you walk out of the arena, Lauren, and saw the difference in the marks? But, but hang on, Cesar, the lowest score was 59. Okay. Oh, boy. And you were how much, how, how? There were two 59s, a 64, a 66, and a 70. Okay, so everybody can understand now the big difference. So, Lori. Well, well, I just want to say to start off, obviously the 59s were wrong. So we're going to go with that. <laughs> of course. Um, so that, that year I was riding a horse named Whitman owned by Jane Sawalski. And it, it was a wonder in some things that we needed to be but for me as a rider and I make this as a rule for myself number one as a rider I never look to see who's in the class and I honestly never look to see who's judging because by the time I go down the center line I can't change what I already know how to do so all I can do is do what I I know do it the best that I can at that point in time have a good time and realize that it is, it's a horse show. Sometimes you just have to go out and do those things that you know that you do really well and try to get through the things that aren't the, the your, so I never know when I'm coming down the, the center line and I always, and my, my vision isn't the best, honestly. So I, I halt at X, I salute, and it's about 10 feet away from, from C that I recognize who's in the, at, at, in the judges boxes because I can't see before that. So when I came out of the arena then, I knew that I had had a good time. So I had no idea what was really going on, but I know that in, of course I would say that Lee was 100% right because he was the highest score, but I, I have to say that, that there was a discrepancy because my center line, my final center line, Lee did give me a very good score on, and he was the one that was sitting on the side. And before that, my Piaf and Passage, the horse was not as, as good in it, but the final center line, it was good. And Lee did give me the points on it. And now when I came out of it and out of the arena, all of the judges got together, Everybody came up to me after, after and even later, later in the night when everything was over and the judges had discussed this. And for me, 
it was a group of judges getting together and discussing my ride. So that, first of all, is a big deal. And the next time I then go down the, down the center line, those judges are going to know what to expect a little bit. And there, there's going to be, there's going to be a little bit of a thought, a little bit more, maybe more watching and seeing what's going on rather than predicting what might have happened. And I think, you know, again, this is also judging the, there can be many different opinions on it. And sometimes it works in your favor and sometimes it doesn't. But in, in the end, I really think that it all levels out. Okay, thank you, Lauren. And Lee, what, what did you learn from that and how did you feel at that point? Oh, I can tell you how I felt at that point. Um, you know how big a salt shaker is? <laughs> well, that's kind of how I felt. Because, uh, you know, when they announced the marks, and uh, the marks were uh, 66, 64, 59, 59, and 70, okay? That's a big discrepancy. And also, I'll say it was my first night class, judging at night, Grand Prix special. And uh, the discrepancy came about because of the passage. The passage had some irregularity to it, especially at the beginning. But when it finished, it finished really strong. And I, I said, will say that I overmarked some of the earlier passages a little bit higher than the rest did. Um, they were on a lower score. Two of them for sure were on a lower score than I was, and I was higher. So with that many passages in that test, that's going to make a big difference. The last center line, however, was fantastic. It was flawless. It was completely regular. And women, I, I think, were almost exactly the same marks with that, mostly eight, eight and a half. But then it all ended and the marks came out. And I remember walking into VIP thing like, oh my God, now what? And uh, most of the people are like cheered, it's like, oh yeah, like don't worry about it, you know, your mark, you're okay. But I thought about it later on and we discussed it. And uh, Wim was fantastic because he mediated that. And the bottom line there was he just simply said to the two people that gave 59, I think you're too harsh. Lee, you're too generous. And you, Mr. 64, you're probably right on. So he was, he was really fantastic about that. Um, and uh, that, that was uh, an interesting kind of a dynamic. And I think what I learned about that was, uh, that I believe was um, a greener type horse starting out. And uh, just because there were some anomalies at a certain point in time in the test, that, that doesn't mean that that's going to happen constantly throughout the test. It also is a representation of, the difference of being on the side and judging and being on the end of the arena. You know, it's all part of the learning curve like we talked about earlier. And that's something that happened to me at the beginning. So I'm kind of glad it happened at the beginning. Good. Thank you very much. So now I want to ask you too the, the same question that is coming. And like I myself as a trainer had many times horses that you start loving a lot and then the owners decide to take them away so how was the feeling of that happening to you as riders and trainers of horses how have you been able to cope with that because i know it's hard but at the same time we have to realize that we don't own the horses and i think it has happened to all of us so do you have any recollection of that happening to you and how have you reacted to that? Uh, and let's start with Lauren. Well, um, I mean, I think that everybody knows that I, I rode Sagacious and it, it um, when I did lose the ride as Sagacious, it was a very emotional period. I was very good friends with the owners and um, the wife had passed away from breast cancer, so there was a lot of emotion involved in it. Um, but the owner had decided to move on. So I had to make a choice at that point in time to say either I can handle this with dignity and grace, which hopefully I did, or I'm going to put my heels in and I may never get another horse again. And so that was a really, it was a tough decision for me, especially with Sagacious, because that was, that was the horse of my lifetime. You know, that was the horse that I, I um, made my name with, and I went 
places that I never dreamed of going. So when uh, that ride then ended, yes, you're heartbroken and um, you love the horses and you love the dream that you had with the horses. But when it comes down to it, you're, you're the rider and you don't have control of those kind of things. I've had several good horses in my life. Um, luckily, I also have made some very nice horses in my life. And I've, I've had the joy of selling some of those nice horses to people that I've been very enthusiastic to see where those horses are going. And I, I quite am excited by that. But I, you know, for me, this is, this, this is my job also. This is how I support myself. This is how I support my family. And I can't support my family without selling a horse. They don't make money with it in your, in your barn riding. So you have to make that decision unless you have another source of income, how you're, you're going to handle that. Um, so there's a lot of emotions involved in it. I, again, I'm grateful for all the horses that I've had and the owners, what they've done, done. And hopefully I'll, you know, as time goes on, that other horses will come into my life and I, and I get to go out there again. Okay, thank you. Lee, would you like to comment on that, the same topic? Sure. Um, well, I remember taking two horses to Germany to train for almost half a year. And uh, that was 19, uh, was it 88, 89, something like that. Uh, 89, 90. And uh, I came back um, and I wanted to try out for the World Equestrian Games. And two weeks before, my own personal horse went lame. And he'd slip going into his stall. This is a true story. This is not a made-up press release. He slipped going into his stall, and they didn't have rubber mats over there. And I remember him sliding. Well, I didn't think anything of it. Um, but anyway, he tore his suspensory ligaments, so he was out. But I, was, I wasn't even home 30 days. And that happened. And then the other horse that I had, my second strain horse, um, the owners ended up going bankrupt, and everything had to be gone in 30 days. Now, that's happened to me twice. And I didn't completely get paid um, on two on another occasion. They couldn't pay me. They went bankrupt. So I took the horse, did all the training. And then uh, oddly enough, the same day that I finalized taking that horse to go to Germany and train for half a year, he colic that night and died. So uh, yes, you know, there's all these experiences that, that happen and add up. Okay, thank you very much, Lee. Now, I, I would like to ask you, like, what recommendations would you give to the young professionals, the people that is starting and want to become a professional, riders that see themselves like becoming the next generation of trainers and or judges, what would you recommend to them? And let's start with Lee this time. Okay. Well, I think that uh, my recommendations would be this thing that's over my head right now, make that a priority. That thing that's behind Lauren right now, make that a priority. Don't spend all your money on horses. When I started out, I was so transfixed on my goal of, of going to the Olympics and, and I had been that way the whole time. My first experience with dressage was watching on TV 1976 Olympics. And I actually watched Crystalot ride there, and I had this obsession to do that. Um, so everything that I did, every, every uh, cell in my body was directed towards making it to the top to get to that goal. And I think it's really important that you have to understand that there are other things in life. I mean, I did not go to my sister's wedding because I had a training bar and I couldn't get somebody to look after it. Now I realize I could have gotten someone to look after it for just a day even. And, and I should have gone, but I didn't. So can I ever go back and do that again? No. Has she forgiven me? Yes. Did it take 10 years? Yes. So I think that it's important to have a balance in life. Uh, otherwise, it's, you're in the barn all, all the time, and you're not doing anything else. And I love horses, and I always have. And I love teaching and training, and I love all the aspects of it. But I also understand that there are other things in life. So prior to me riding, I 
was an apprentice to uh, auto body repairman. I worked in a machine shop, rebuilding engines. I loved the idea of racing cars. There were all kinds of other things I was interested in. Um, but if you don't keep a balance in your life, then you will not function as best as you can. And this will be hard on the people around you, uh, significant other, if you're married or you just have a girlfriend or something or boyfriend, and it's not going to work out that well. So my recommendation is that you have to think about the whole thing. You have to keep things in a balance. You also have to realize that you have to prepare for your future. And, you know, I, I planted a tree out front of my house three and a half years ago. It's massive now. And I can kind of appreciate that as a concept. And I have this house. Uh, my first house was a dilemma between buy a new horse that might take me far or buy a house. And given that up to that point, many good things had happened, but many bad things had happened, I chose the house. So I think it's important that you have a plan, but also part of the plan is that you need to be flexible. And the word balance, I can't say enough about that. There is one other component, and that is survival. You have to understand that if you're going to do this, that you have to be prepared to be here for a long time. Mm -hmm. A month ago, one of my Facebook friends wrote on Facebook a commentary about this whole thing we're talking about right now. And she's, I think, 26 and, uh, you know, asked questions. And I replied and said, look, do this again in 10 years because you're feeling the pressure of it right now, but you're only 26. And then you're going to be 36 and 46 and one day 56. So you have to realize you're, if you're going to do this, you have to be in it for the long haul. You have to survive many difficulties, but the rewards when they come along will be very big rewards. Lee, thank you very much. That, that, that was very, very, very nice and very impressive. And I think people watching this or people that will watch this afterwards because it's going to be recorded, it's being recorded and I will upload it to YouTube. will really appreciate your comments. Thanks a lot. And then, Lauren, what would be your advice for those people that, you know, the amateurs of today that want to become the professionals of the future? Well, I think, and I say this all, all the time, that I am so grateful for what, what I do. And I'm so grateful that I get to wake up in the morning and I get to ride horses and I get to teach, which I love to do. And there is nothing in my life that that entitled me to this. It just, I worked hard and I am appreciative, but it wasn't owed to me. And I think that when the younger generation um, comes along, that they need to realize that you take the jobs sometimes that don't pay you any money. Sometimes that's where you're gonna get the most learning. Yeah. And I've always had the theory and I, I continue to have this theory that, you know, things will work out on the end. And if I'm doing something that's along my path of learning and along my, my moral concepts that things will, are going to work out in the end and it might, you might go through difficult times, but you, you have to put in the hours and you have to put in the work and you're not entitled to it. You didn't, you didn't deserve it. We're lucky to be able to do this job and we're lucky to be in this industry that is really so, so amazing and so privileged that we're able to do this. But I think that the only way that anybody continues in this industry and um, can have any sort, sort of sustainability is to continue to educate yourself. And you have to be willing to go back and you know, one of, the, one of the things that I find so great about Wellington is I sit by the side of the arena and I watch everybody ride from the beginner ladies to the uh, to other professionals teaching to the professionals that I that I meant that I idolize. I watch them ride and I I always want to be better. I always want to learn how somebody else is navigating maybe a, a question that they're being being asked by a horse. I want to see what they're doing. So the, the way that you stay relevant and the way that you stay 
immersed in this is to keep your eyes open for the opportunity to learn because they are everywhere around you. You can learn from anyone. You can learn what you don't want to do and you can learn what you want to become. So I think there's so many opportunities that that people can really take in that. And I think, you know, that would be my advice is that if you, if you really want to do this and it is your passion and it's something that you are willing to sacrifice many things for, that you have to be open to all those opportunities. Great, Lauren, thank you very much. I, I do agree, this is a beautiful and wonderful uh, industry, but at the same time, there's a lot of competition. You know, we have to accept that. So I would like to ask you, how do you, de how do you deal with, the, with that competition among trainers? You know, like sometimes you see trainers trying to get other people's horses or other trainers' students. How do you deal with that? Because that is probably not easy. How, how do you handle that? Lee, would you like to answer first? <laughs> I'll answer while Lauren formulates her answer. <laughs> well, we have a lot of canals here in Florida. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Oh, moderator. Um, well, from the training point of view, um, I've always been a student of study, and I totally agree with what Lauren said in the last moments, and that is, and by no means would I ever think that I've come to a, a junction in life where I, I don't need to continue to learn. Um, that's happening all the time. And I find a lot of fun in that, regardless of what that may be. It could be anything, not totally unrelated to horses. So I think that learning curve is constantly ongoing. But I study a lot. Of, I study what people are teaching. And uh, there's no point in me regurgitating their message. There's no point in me teaching them, uh, uh, some particular person, uh, something that they've already heard before. So I look at what is it that's not taught uh, or what's difficult to teach? What does nobody want to teach? And then from my judging perspective, and I'm going to say that gives me quite an advantage to sit for a day or several days in a row and uh, look at 80, 90 courses um, in a particular division, like we can do that here easily in Wellington, small tour, that's easy to do, and you'll come up with statistics. And so in, in a lot of my training and lessons and whatnot, I put those statistics into practice um, as well. I try and educate more of the, the students beyond the scope of just riding the horse. And the basic formulas of riding a horse and being successful could be applied to anything that you do. That's not that difficult if you know what they are. But I think that I like to try and teach what other people don't. And sometimes that's difficult uh, because not everybody wants to hear that message. Not everybody wants to hear what you're not really good at. For myself, for improvement in any way, shape or form, I wanna look at two things. What am I good at and what am I doing well? And what am I not doing well? Whatever it is that I'm not doing well, that needs improvement. Do I like it? No. Do I want to improve? Yes. Do I need to do it? Yes. Am I going to do it? Do I want to improve? Yes. And yes and yes. So I think that it's important that you come to that kind of stage in, in your uh, training or life, whatever you want to call it, but it can't just be all the easy stuff. It can't just be of 33 movements in the Grand Prix while well, I'm good at most of them, but there's one or two that I'm not good at and I don't have to work at it. Well, okay, but somebody else is going to be really good at that movement. And guess what? When push comes to shove, it's less than a point that's going to separate first and second. So um, those are my feelings on that. I try and listen to what other people are saying. And, uh, and also I like to deliver my message in such a way that makes people think and they become smarter. Because when you, this is a big thing for me at this stage in life anyway, um, when you resort to being physical as your fallback position, you have not thought enough about what you've been doing. Because as a really good quality trainer and coach, you should be able to think your way through most of the obstacles that are in front of you. And to me, that would be the art in this style of riding, to be able to do that. 
That was, that was really amazing, Lee. Thank you very much. And, and before I give the floor to Lauren, there is a question for you, Lee, from the audience. Do you miss competing now that you're training and judging all the time? Do you miss competing? Yes, I do to a degree. Um, I, I think I, my last year riding, I had an epiphany and I was riding in the warm up ring at Wellington and I was waiting to do my Grand Prix. And uh, it wasn't a great horse. It was a nice horse, but he was not great. And I could never rely on him. And I was in my mind um, having a bit of a dilemma. And, and one half of the dilemma was, uh, if this doesn't turn out well, and I have to call this lady and tell her how the test went, what am I gonna say, right, as a professional? And uh, so I was riding around, it was back when you didn't have to have a hat on. I remember that late in the day. And then, um, I just had this thought that, well, it's not you that would have failed. You're riding a horse, horses are horses. They're unpredictable. You know, he might canter in the passage transition and him. if he does that, it's gonna be a disaster. So it's a horse. And I finally said to myself, this horse does not define me. I define myself. Riding the horse, that's an addition to me. It's an extension of me, but he's a horse. And I have to be realistic about that. So there was a big difference for me because then I relaxed and I was fine if I had to call her and say, well, you know, he cantered at M. He cantered at M. I didn't give him the aids to canter at M. It's how it went. So yeah, I do kind of miss, I miss that. And I miss, I kind of like having a tool of representation of, I've always been one to never ask anybody to do something that I couldn't do myself. So I kind of miss it from that point of view to be able, able to, demonstrate that moving tack box up the ramp into the trailer that would be a no <laughs> okay and and lauren then going back to you do do you want to answer that question about the competition or would you i you know i i can answer that that brief briefly number um what i'd like to say on on that is for me I think the relationship between professionals is very, very important. And I think that um, I don't worry about people taking my clients. I don't worry about my clients going to somebody else. What I worry about is, is being the best at what I can be, be at that moment. I can yeah. have all of these tools in my toolbox and I want to share them with the people that I write, that I teach. If what I have in my toolbox isn't what somebody is looking for or doesn't work with somebody or they have different goals or then they need to move to somebody else yeah. and they need to find somebody else that might have better tools, might have better ways to saying it or might have something that they agree with more. So when I have students, my thought if my students want to move on to somebody, that's, that's okay. That's okay. I, I, I very much want to see people succeed. I love to teach people. I love to watch people get better. Sometimes that means for them to get better is to get another point of view and to come back and have it be a collaboration. And, and that's what training is about. I have many different great opinions from many different trainers in my head. Yeah. I need to make them my own. If I can add to another rider with some of my ideas to have them form their own uh, opinions, I think that that's, that's great. I think as far as um, relationships within professionals, I think it's very, for me, I'm very, very transparent on things. If I have somebody that has called me to take lessons and I know that there's somebody else's students, my first thing that I will say to that person, would you let your trainer know that you've approached me to take lessons? Or if somebody wants to come to me for training and I know it's somebody else's long time student, I will call up as a courtesy to another professional and say, you know, I just want to let you know that this person is coming to me, coming to me for training, not to change that person's point of view, but I think that's a respect that you do for other people in the, in the industry of which I am appreciative for and what I like other people to do with, with me. I, I am, um, you know, I, I, there are so many students in this world and there's so many people that want to learn. 
that I don't believe in this holding on to people because I think if you hold on to people, they can't breathe anymore. I think people need to learn and they need to, they want to be with you because it's what you're offering them. So I don't, I don't have that sort of idea of the competitiveness between professionals. Lauren, thank you very much. It's great to hear that. I have, I have a question from you from the, for you from the audience. In the last session, we talked about the stages of becoming a licensed judge. The, the, Richard is asking, what are the stages of becoming a licensed coach or licensed trainer in the U.S.? Is there such a thing in the U.S.? Um, not that I know of. I know that they've tried to implement several programs um, that haven't had, they had the uh, instructor certification program, which I think that they're trying to, to revamp a bit. I think it would be helpful to have a more structured uh, system, but at the moment, um, there are many people that, that are teaching and I'm not quite sure, you know, where that is coming from. Um, so it, in the United States, I think that, that it's not as structured as it should be. And I think that it will become more structured. And I think that, that, that would be a positive thing. Okay. We're, we're getting to, to our, our end and towards the end. So I'd like to ask you like, uh, probably closing remarks from both of you, if there is anything you want to ask regarding this ups and downs of being a, an equestrian. And one last question from Lee. Uh, the question is from Tanya. She's asking, as trainers, what gets you excited about your student or riders you meet at clinics? So with that question and some closing remarks, which one, would like, which one of you would like to start? I'm going to take the floor, Lee. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, so when I was at the, t the top of my competitive career with, with Sagacious, and right after the Pan American Games, I then knew that I wanted to start a family. And I, um, when I announced that I was pregnant and going to start a family, one of the top... Um, people in our industry and at that time in our federation looked at me and said, you have just ruined your career. And I need to say that um, I, as I can bring this back a little bit and say that when riding did not, um, when the horses and my riding was not responsible for my happiness and responsible for all of my dreams in my life, that's when I became a better rider. And that's when I became a better trainer because there was not this pressure that it was my everything. And I think that's one of the reasons that I, I do look up to Ashley Holzer so much because I watched her manage her family, her children, her career, and the way that, there was this ebb and flow and she could put 100% in to her horses when she was there and she was a mother when she needed to be and she could come back with a with a with full fury back into the horses again and i think that you know this is a demanding career and it again is it, i'm very grateful for the life that i have but there is um you become your best when, when you can bring all of yourself into this sport and you can really, really come about it without the pressure of it being your everything, but you can have it, it flow with you. Lee. That's wonderful, Lauren. Thank you very much. That, that was really touching and, and important, I think, to share with everybody. So Lee, what well, first, firstly, I agree 1,000%. Um, growing up and, and going along, as I said, I had that dream I wanted to go to the Olympics. But um, as time passed and many of these things occurred, some of them not so great, um, what I came to understand was that and I gave up my desire 
to go to the Olympics because I noticed that a lot of the trials, there'd be a lot of conflict and people were unhappy and, and that was a very difficult situation. Um, so I just, I said one day that that's not my goal anymore. And when I left the farm and I came to Ontario, I had 12 goals. They were all very defined, very well defined. And uh, I wanted all of them. And so I got 11 of them. The 12th one was that I had wanted to go to the Olympics. But then I changed my mind and I decided that that was no longer important for me. In fact, I would enjoy riding and I would enjoy showing. And at that particular time, I ended up with a really nice show horse and small tour and she was very successful. So I did in, enjoy that. And that part of, of life was great. So I think it's important that you don't hang everything on one goal. And exactly what Lauren said, I mean, being a, a top professional, also a, one of my goals was when I was a kid to be the best. And then I realized going along, you know, be one of the best because who's ever really the best? You're, you're the best at what one competition and, and that defines you. So, you know, be in the top tier, but live your life and live other things in your life. Lauren, you had a family. I totally appreciate that now. Maybe back when I was 25, I would totally not get that. But I think this point of perspective of balance is crucially important for myself. When I could let go of some things like that laser beamed visionary goal, and I could drop down from being an A plus personality to just an A plus, then I found that life was a lot easier to live. And I also could, could uh, see something else. And that was called opportunity. If you get too focused on this one thing that you want, you're not going to see all these other little potential opportunities that float around you all the time. And I miss so many of those. But I woke up to that about five or six years ago. And five or six years ago, I decided to change my plan. And my plan five or six years ago was to not have one. And to just <laughs> float around. Yes, an A triple plus personality floating around without a plan, try and do that. Best thing I ever did because everything improved. My quality of life improved, my teaching improved, my riding improved, my relationship with my dogs improved. So <laughs> that's what I have to say about that, Cesar. Okay, well, I have to tell you something. I knew that you two were very good, but this was just outstanding. I really enjoyed it a lot, I'm sure all the participants also enjoy it. I think we've covered most of the questions. Uh, so we're, we're not going to close the chat and uh, the conference so that people can stay on and ask some other questions and interact to each other. But before, before we finish, I want to thank you all for coming here today. I really want to thank from the bottom of my heart to Lee and and um, and to Lauren because what you did today was very very touchy it was it was very emotional for me at least I think you you gave all your heart in this in this talk and for that I really want to thank you a lot and then thank you Cesar you're welcome Thank you very much. And, and then before we, we finish the recording, I would like everybody to know that next Friday, we will have Christoph Hess and Eva Miller, both from Germany, talking about the training of the young horses for the highest levels of dressage. Then the other Tuesday, we will have Maribel Alonso from Mexico and Juan Matute from Spain. Uh, talking about the importance of the basics for each category and how to reach the, the Grand Prix. And then uh, a week from today, we will have Morgan Barbanson from France. She used to write for the Spanish team, but now she writes from France. And Bernard Morel, which is uh, an FEI judge, and they will talk about how to look for a dressage horse. So we, we're getting this going. And well, I want to thank you all. Uh, now I will stop the recording, but um, we can continue talking here and you can continue making questions for everybody. So thank you very much. I hope you stay. We're, we're planning to have what we call 
an after party so you can bring your drinks, light your cigarettes, and we can <laughs> all talk instead of being at home isolated. We feel like we have more than 40 people to talk hey. to, so that's fun. So I, I give the floor to Susan now. Hi, everybody. So that was wonderful.